Hello, hello, and welcome back, or welcome to the Yogi Roth Show. I'm your host, Yogi Roth, and really fired up about today's guest. First and foremost, I want to thank you for the support. Keep subscribing, rating, reviewing, sharing. Um, we've hit record numbers over the last month, so whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And of course, if you have thoughts on guests, pass them along. And if you've missed any guests, just go to yogiroth.com slash podcasts. We've had some really fun and insightful conversations, and I think today... So we're at the midpoint in major college football. You're really going to dig our next guest. His name is Tanner Mangum. Tanner is now the starting quarterback at BYU, but you're going to get to know him on many other levels. If you rewind the clock, this young man went from under-recruited from Eagle, Idaho, to being the co-MVP of the Elite 11 alongside a guy named Jameis Winston. From that moment, when his face was all over ESPN, his life changed. College coaches began to call him in colleges that he never thought would call him, but he stayed with his commitment to BYU. He also stayed with his commitment to take a Mormon mission, and he ended up in Chile for two years. When he comes back, all of a sudden, he just throws a Hail Mary in his first game and again bursts right back onto the major college football scene. Uh, We talk all about that and his journey, but really we take a deep dive into mental health. And many of you know this is Mental Health Awareness Month. And many of us may not know, I did not, that one in five student athletes seek help with mental health. And Tanner and I go deep on that, as he was one of the first student athletes and one of the first college football players and definitely one of the first quarterbacks in this era in major college football to talk about his own battles with mental health. And it's a very candid conversation. We talk about what coaches can do, parents, teammates, his process, his journey, and he's an insightful young man. Uh, we met when he was 16, and now he's 25. Um, it's crazy to think how fast time went on, but he's one of those guys I've stayed connected with, and he's a guy that has inspired me, and I think he'll inspire a lot of you with his courage. And like he says, quote, it's not a weakness to get help. It's actually a sign of strength. So I'm going to get out of the way. This is Tanner Mangum. All right, like I talked about in the open, really looking forward to today's guest. So, Tanner, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Yogi, thanks for having me. Good to be here. I love it. All right, so as you know, you know, listen to this podcast, it's all about what does it mean to be human, you know, the human side of sport. And for me, I've dedicated my life to seeking and uncovering the humanity within it. And as I was thinking about guests here in season four, um, which is a big focus on college football, I've thought about you really since the ideation of the idea. So I'm really pumped to have you on, man, and I'm looking forward to going deep with you. That sounds good. I'm I'm honored. I'm honored that you think of me. This is, I think it's I think it's an important topic. I think it's very uh, relevant and something that uh, that I'm interested in as well. So happy to help out. Okay, cool. So uh, let's go way back, which which is crazy because I don't think I can go this far back with a current college student athlete. Uh, <laughs> I want to go back to prior to your senior year of high school. So what is that like? 2012? 2011. 2011. Okay. Even worse, right? So 2011. <laughs> I know. I, I always like asking people this question who, uh, who I've known. Do you remember the first time meeting and what's your memory there? And I'm going to tell you my first time meeting you. Yes. I remember my first time meeting you, um, was at the elite 11 Crap, now, now, wait, now, now I'm second guessing myself. Was it was it at the Elite Eleven in Malibu, or did we meet at the regional in Palo Alto? We met at the regional in Palo Alto, and I even have it on video of you and I talking yes. about, you know, what you're going to go do next in a drill. <laughs> okay, I I didn't. That now now it's coming back to me a little bit. I remember meeting at Palo Alto, I, I, but I now 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 I feel like. I'm, I'm second guessing my all my uh, all my judgment and questioning everything now. You, you might have to refresh my memory a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no. Because I remember, I specifically remember, I remember really well the Elite Eleven in Malibu and just connecting with you and 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 you were, you know, you were there with us every day talking to us. I remember you kind of pumping me up before one of the uh, accuracy competitions, following me around during that drill. And uh, and then just just kind of bonding from there, but you might have to refresh my memory on Palo Alto. Yeah, well, I think that that's the fun part of the question, right? I mean, everybody, I think, you know, we could all say the same thing. I could put a peanut butter and jelly in front of you, and and in front of me, we could have two totally different memories of it. Uh, same thing with <laughs> with meeting people. I think we always see things through our own lens, and I think it's important always, even in totally. fun, 
totally. to, to go back to those. So I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, it was a loaded regional in Northern California. And you don't know this, but that morning I went and had breakfast with Trent Dilfer and at the time executives from ESPN and student sports. And we went there to talk to him about being the head coach of the Elite 11. And at that time, there was a chance that it was going to be John Gruden. There was a chance it was going to be Trent. I mean, there was a bunch of names being floated to be the next head coach of Elite 11. And I had been a carryover from 2009 when I finished coaching at SC. So I'd been the host of it for the, the past couple of seasons prior to, uh, prior to that time meeting you. Mm-hmm. So I go to this little hotel, this like, of course, like this hipster boutique hotel, and we all cramp in this little like loungy area and there's Trent, like all six foot four of them, just a massive human. <laughs> then there's me and like producers and we're all kind of hanging out. And I t- say to him, I said, dude, you, you're just going to enjoy it. Why don't you just come out for the day? There's a lot of talented players and just observe it. So he's like, all right, I'll, I'll come. So he comes out and he's got his, you know, he's got his stonewashed jeans on, he's got a t-shirt on and, uh, and he's got a clipboard and I'll never forget his clipboard. And at that regional, you, I'm sure you remember the players, but there were guys like Jake mm-hmm. Rodriguez, who I called Baby Sanchez at the time, Baby Mark Sanchez. Yep. There was Connor Brewer, who ended up going to Texas, Arizona, and Virginia. Um, it was just a loaded regional by Elite 11 terms. At the West Coast, it was one of the deepest years in the history of Elite 11 and in the history of high school football. Yep. And everybody thought there was like the next everything was there. And we knew about you. This, you know, talented 6'3", you were probably like a buck 80, maybe, buck 85. <laughs> I was pretty skinny. You know, out of, out of Eagle, right? Eagle, Idaho or something like that? Correct, yes. And yes. Uh, everybody loved your tape, but we didn't know because you clearly weren't from like the biggest community like all these other guys. Yeah. Like SoCal or Texas or whatever. Exactly. And, uh, I was from small town Idaho. Yes, and I love that because I'm small town Pennsylvania. And I remember walking up to you, and so much so the producer, I don't know if I still have it, but he sent me a clip of you where I, I'm standing next to you, and I go, hey, man, why don't you just go rip it and just cut it loose? And you kind of look <laughs> at me, it's just like the smile you have on right now, and you're like, I got it, bro. And it was like the coolest thing going, and I was like, I like this guy. It was awesome, man. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so that's how I remember you. I love that's, it. That's how it started. And then, of course, we go to the Elite 11 Finals, and you were Johnny Accuracy, and wearing the yellow accuracy championship jersey uh, running around the field and what's funny is literally at my home as we're recording this the guy who directed the elite 11 series his name is andrew stefan you know his sister annabelle stefan one of the producers annabelle, on, yeah on that show and uh, he's at my house right now so we got a lot of people that uh, love you and your story and following your path man so yeah that's i guess where it all began the elite 11 it really yeah it really did that that was a unique time for me just because as we talked about i was I'm just this small town kid from Idaho, and, and I never really thought about being on the national scene. I never really thought about being in the national spotlight as far as high school quarterbacks go. Um, I knew I had some talent. I knew that I was I was capable, but I never really pictured doing you know being at these at these national camps and then going to the Elite Eleven. And the, it was an awesome experience just just to be able to not only play football, obviously, and 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 interact with you know some of the top quarterbacks in the country but just the friendships and the relationships that it gave me and kind of the, the family the brotherhood aspect of it you know like I still stay in contact with you and Trent and Annabelle and um you know just it's, it's George Whitfield it's just, it's just cool to be able to have an experience like that that impacts you you know for for years and and, and for the rest of your life. It really was was interesting looking back on it. I mean, you, you look back on that class, and just to set the scene for the listeners, we're at Pepperdine University, the home of Mike Leach. If you didn't know that, he got a law degree there. Um, but it's uh, Pepperdine <laughs> University, and it's overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It was the first time I'd ever been to Pepperdine because it's kind of out there, up the up Route 1 yeah, in same, Southern California. Same here. I'd, I'd never been there. Yeah, they don't have a football team, so that means they don't have a football field. So we've got to like this makeshift field, but overlooks the ocean, and you you're absolutely ripping it kind of coming out of nowhere and on the final day we're about to name an mvp and i want to go into your world and i'm going to take you into the coach's world because you end up being named the co-mvp with someone everybody knows and somebody nobody knows one is neil bertram who went to smu and he's now coaching the other was Jameis winston prior to the announcement i'm curious what was going through your head i think I knew Jameis was 
the closest competition. Uh, I think I just knew he, he'd performed really well. And not only did he perform well, but he just had that, that, that charisma about him. Everyone kind of respected him. Everyone knew that he was one of the guys. Um, and then I, I'd also been just super impressed by, by Neil. Um, just because he, again, he kind of similar to me, kind of an, an, a lesser known guy. No one had really heard of him. He didn't even have any offers, but yet here he was just slinging it. And, and he had, a, you know, just a cannon of an arm, a quick release. And he really was impressive. And when it came to that, to that announcement, I, I don't know. I was just thinking, okay, like it's, it's either, I think it's either me or Jameis. That's kind of, that was kind of my thinking. Cause I, I, I felt good about what I had done. I felt good about how I had performed, but I knew that Jameis played well. And so I, you know, wouldn't have been surprised if he got it. And then when, 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 when Trent announced a three headed MVP, I remember thinking, Oh, wow. I, I was not expecting this at all. I thought, you know, I thought they'd just pick one and, and go with it. But uh, I guess it was too close to call. And so being able to, um, you know, be, be named an MVP was, was a huge honor and, you know, just, it, it meant a lot. And then it kind of, it kind of stuck with me for, for, for many years. You know, even now to this day, people will ask like, Hey, you were co MVP with James Winston. Right. And, and people still bring it up, you know, here it is seven years later and people still kind of link me with playing with James in high school way back when in 2011. And, and uh, so it, it was a, a cool, cool experience. And I, you know, just learned a lot and, and had, a lot, had a lot of fun interacting with those guys, playing with those guys. And, and it was fun to play well as well. Yeah. So I have a role in this podcast, which is only to ask questions I don't know the answer to. So the, the element of the Elite 11 that I'd love to know about and learn about is you get named co-MVP or co-co-MVP, however that is. <laughs> and, and I'll never forget our meeting. It was Kenny O'Brien, uh, myself, Matt James, Brian Stumpf. Uh, I think there was one other vote. I'm trying to think who it was. And uh, we all were in a circle. We were next to the producer. And you had to make it pretty quick because they're filming it. Remember the dramatic yeah. way where everybody stepped onto the platform and the – E and 11 yeah. were there. And uh, and I remember as the votes went around, um, everybody had to pick their who they were winning. And it was even. And then I remember it came down to the final vote. And the final vote could have swung it one way, which, you know, whether you or Jameis or Neil, probably wasn't going to go to Neil. Um, it was either you or Jameis. And, uh, and I remember that last vote. And when it happened, and, and all the coaches were like, yeah, you know, everybody played really well. Because you, you referenced Neil, kind of he, he really threw the ball well. Jameis just had, you know, the the magnitude that that everybody's gotten to know at least uh, on the field and with his teammates, and and you were you were dealing yeah. as well. And the producer goes, "Come on, like seriously, there's no way this can be a this is terrible television." And uh, and we stuck with it because you know I've been in other TV settings where you kind of make the change for the sake of the television or the programming and, and we didn't yeah. do it. And that's something yeah. I think our staff was proud of. And the producer was just kind of rub, you know, ribbing us for it, but uh, we all had a good laugh. But I, what I want to ask you about, so that day ends and, and you know, Twitter's going like social media is not as insane as it is now, but it's going and you go from Eagle, Idaho population, whatever Eagle, Idaho is, but definitely not Los Angeles to yeah. one of the top quarterbacks in the country when this airs on ESPN in, a, I think it was a three part series that year. Did your life change? Mm -hmm. And if so, uh, what what did you what did you feel, and what did you have to deal with as you now had a label next to your name? It it definitely did change. Uh, you know, even though I was already committed to play at BYU, other schools started reaching out a little bit more, and and you know, just kind of it kind of opened the recruiting game a little bit. But I I I was I was very set on going to BYU, so it, it didn't necessarily. Um, change my mind or sway my opinion, but it all of a sudden these bigger SEC schools, Pac-12 schools start talking to my high school coach, you know, asking if, if I'm interested in, in decommitting. Um, all of a sudden, af after the, the Elite 11 aired on ESPN, I started getting so many friend requests on Facebook. At this time, I didn't have Twitter <laughs> or, or Instagram. All I had was Facebook. And, um, and so I just started getting all of these friend requests who people who had seen it on, on TV and they were messaging me and just kind of, you know, it was kind of eye opening. And then, and then also I think it gave me a lot of confidence. It was almost some, some 
like affirmation and a reassurance that yeah like okay like you're good like you know, you're 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 a good player and you're and you're you should be confident in your abilities and it kind of it helped me have a really good senior year and we, we we played we played really well that year we lost in the state championship unfortunately but but I played well and it just kind of gave me a lot of confidence and um just kind of helped me see that okay you know if, if I if I if I work hard like I like I like I've been doing and then I can accomplish big things even though I might be a kid from a smaller town someone who maybe is not as well known I can still um you know work hard and and, and accomplish big things so you have this mindset the world is loving you you seem to have stayed <laughs> the course with your mission which was to go on a mission I yeah. think when people see that from the quarterback standpoint um you, you look at history and quarterbacks who've gone on the mission Everybody doesn't always always come back and rip it. So I'm curious for you, you're in this conversation as one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Did you did you did you think again about hey I'm, I'm going to go on this mission, or are you like yo I might be able to go be like an NFL player? I mean, 86 percent of the quarterbacks <laughs> in the league are elite eleven quarterbacks. Their trajectory is you know you know what what the elite eleven has done for quarterbacks, or at least the the stigma and label and opportunity it gives some guys. So I'm curious if if you had this you know, inner dialogue around that thought or were you set to go? I I really was set to go. I, I think I just had it set in my mind that I was going to go and nothing was going to get in the way of that. And I remember at the Elite 11 talking to guys about the fact that I was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and that I was going to go on this two-year mission and people were kind of confused a little bit. And then I, I also remember going to the Under Armour All-American game in January in Florida and, and the same thing, people asking me about the church and my religious beliefs and the fact that I was going to take two years off to go to a foreign country and, 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 you know, teach people about Jesus Christ and, and the gospel and things like that. And people were just so kind of weirded out. They were like, why, why would you do that? Why would you take two years off? Like you're just throwing everything away. But I don't know. I, I just I had it set in my mind. I had it set in my heart that I that I wanted to do it. I, I knew it was important, and that it would be a good thing for me. That I would learn a lot of important life lessons, and I knew that that football, though a dream of mine, it wasn't everything. There was still there were still other things that I wanted to do and other things that I wanted to to accomplish. And so, despite the notoriety and the fame that came that year it didn't really change my mind it's just because I knew it was such a, an important thing and something that I'd set my mind to. I love that, man. And, uh, and, you know, we have another guy, Tanner McKee, who, who you probably have gotten to know a little bit, who's yeah. the yeah. 11 quarterback committed to Stanford and, uh, and he's on his mission as well. And, uh, and I love it. I think you're such a great example to young men who, uh, you know, can think beyond football and utilize football to, um, enhance their life and take the things from their life and, and pour them back into the game. And I think that's a, a, a different lens to look through. So you go to Chile on your mission and I'm yeah. curious what skill set you bring back when you get to campus. And did you think about it? You know, I know you're over there and you, I just had to talk to Britton Covey uh, of Utah, you know, I work for the PAC 12 network. So yeah. I had to talk to him about his, yeah. and, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you balanced a passion and a love of yours with a passion and a love of yours, or if you found room for both, or if all they are is the form and your essence is, you know, really uh, spread throughout football and spreading the message that you wanted to spread. That's a good question. I, I think there is a passion for both and, and, um, being down there, I, I just knew that okay, you know, this is this is a time, a chance for me to kind of forget about myself and just kind of lose myself and focus on serving others and really getting to know others and love other people and get to know their stories and their background and and not worry about football at that time. And 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 it was it was an amazing life changing experience to kind of put everything else aside. And just put everything on hold, and 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 not not just football, but just everything. You know, like your your social life, 
your phone, internet, you know, just think, basic things that we do every day is just a chance to really get down to the core of people and, and, and just, and, 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 and the core of your inner self and just getting to know yourself better and, and getting to know other people better in a different culture and a different world. It was just, it was just amazing. And just being able to see a different country and see a different culture and to be able to connect with them and live with them and see that we are so alike, you know, we, there's, there is so much that bonds us that connects us that regardless of where we're from in the world, we're, we all share that same sense of humanity, that same heart, if that makes sense. And it was just a really cool opportunity to be able to do, to do that. And I knew that if I just, you know, dedicated my whole heart to that, that I would get a lot out of it. And I definitely did. And then when my two years were up, I knew it was time to go back and, and time to pursue, you know, my, my other passion. And, and, and so I think there, there was room for both. And, and, and I think it, I came back with uh, an appreciation for life and appreciation for people, um, an appreciation for my family and the things that I've gone through. And I also came back with a love for the Spanish language and I love speaking Spanish and having that, uh, that skill. And, um, and then it just, I came back a more mature individual. I think I just felt, I felt more um, experienced and had gained some wisdom through experiences that I'd had and um, just felt like it was a really uh, a huge growth experience for me. And, and I think uh, it was, you know, something that, that I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't trade for the world just because of how special and unique it was. Yeah, I want to lean into that a little bit. Um, you said, you know, you felt that you could do both. And I think a lot of student athletes feel as though like, hey, man, football is just my job. And I, and I get it. I, I live that commitment, um, much like yourself and your teammates and other college student athletes around the country. Uh, but I think that there's this untapped world in collegiate athletics that is often untapped, which is the world, which is, you know, how football can be the bridge to so many other passions in your life. Uh, I'm curious if you agree with that statement um, and have brought it back to you as you re-entered. And I know, you know, BYU may be the, the culture there is different than other institutions. I, I can't speak to that. But I'm curious if you brought back that thought of, you know, college athletes can do a lot. And, and I'm going to be a great example of that. I So I guess re- repeat your question of... of... I guess I'm curious if you think that, you know, you can be more than an athlete or when you got to be a college athlete, that's all you can do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you and I have talked about this in the past, you know, working together at at other um, elite 11 camps in the previous summers that, that that's, that's one of the, one of my, I guess, passions, I guess you could say is kind of helping people understand and, and other athletes understand that you can use this platform that college football gives you for so much good. It gives you an opportunity to reach out to others that you wouldn't be able to reach out to otherwise. But this platform that playing football at the college level, um, you know, being a quarterback, a, a recognizable figure, gives you an opportunity to, to make connections that in no other way would you be able to make. And that football is, is, is an avenue, it's a vehicle that, that can set you up for the rest of your life if, if, if you choose it, if you choose to, make, choose, choose to make it that. And it can allow you to connect with people, to, to network, to come in contact with different organizations, different nonprofits, different, um, different opportunities to, to serve and help and, and, and reach out to others. And, um, and I think that's one of the best things that I've been able to get from the game of football is, is, is just that, that opportunity to be more than just an athlete, the opportunity to be more than just a football player. Um, you know, I, I love the game of football, but it's a game that you can't play for the rest of your life. You know, you have a, you have an expiration date, so to speak. You can, you can only, you can only play for so many years physically, but the people you meet, the relationships that you form, the lessons you learn, those are lifelong. And, and I think it's so important for people to realize and, and for people to understand is, is that something that you can take with you for the rest of your life. And that's something that they can't take away from you, regardless of if you're playing or not. Yeah, uh, that's really well said. And I hope all the uh, 
student athletes and, and incoming collegiate student athletes hear you and listen to that because because you're spot on. So here you are. You come back from your mission. Uh, you get yourself back in shape, and you got a quarterback who's ahead of you. And okay, life is cool. And then all of a sudden, you're just going to throw a hail mary against Nebraska on the road in your first game in the history of college football. <laughs> um, talk about dropping in, bro. I mean. What is what was that like? Because here you are. I'm just imagining you in this village in Chile, you know, helping the community, digging in, talking, spreading the yeah. message, and then you're in front of. I'm guessing here, but I've been in Nebraska Stadium, and a, it's awesome, and b, there's probably a hundred plus thousand fans in there, and you just drop a dime to win the game. I'm kind of two different <laughs> planets, let alone two different continents. What was that like for you to come back oh, into college ext- football? Extremely different, extremely different planets, different, different. Uh, a different life, you know, it, it, um, it was crazy. It, it was, it was, un, it was unexpected. Um, you know, unfor- unfortunately Taysom, uh, got, got hurt early in the game and, and I had to come in and, and, and just you know, do, do my best, you know, just, do, I think, um, I learned an important lesson there that you just, you have to be ready because you never know when your number is going to be called. And, um, and, and that was another life changing event right there. I went from being, the backup, um, kind of, again, relatively lesser known. And now all of a sudden I'm thrust into the starting position, the spotlight and, and, and two weeks in a row that we had the Hail Mary against Nebraska. Then the next week we had a last second, last minute touchdown pass to beat Boise state. And this, you know, it was kind of like, wow, like, welcome back, you know, welcome back to the States. I'd only been home for a few months and I was still struggling to get back into shape, but here I was playing again. And, it was a lot of fun. It was it was exciting because just you know I I I missed the game and, and you know taking a couple of years off it makes you miss it a little bit and it was fun to be back playing the game being on a team you know being a part of that camaraderie um, and and then to have those exciting victories and to be a part of that experience was just was just a lot of fun and um, uh, but you know but uh, yeah I, I guess that would answer that question is just all of a sudden. It's it's something new, and 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 I think that's kind of been a story of of, of my life these past few years. It's just unexpected, you know, just constant twists and turns and things that you never might expect. But then you just learn to make the most of it, and you learn to to adjust, and that, that kind of makes makes life exciting, just because you never know what's going to happen, and you you just have to be ready and and uh, and make the most of of whatever comes your way. Yeah, no, the life has definitely thrown a lot of different curveballs at you. Um, I think when we talk about college football, as we've referenced, there's so much more to it. You know, if you look at college football now, um, you've got games dedicated to raising awareness around ending sexual violence on college campus. Brenda Tracy was just on my podcast uh, a week ago. You know, I partnered with Alexis Jones around the same message. Yeah. You, know, you know, Alexis yeah. with her protector program. Um, we often talk at the Elite 11 on mental skills. You, uh, over a year ago, talked about mental health. Um, Curious if you could take us through your path there and and not only why you decided to share a part of your story, but what the reaction to that has been for you. Yeah, that's no, I'm happy I'm more than happy to talk about it. It's it's been um yeah, over a year and a half now since I since I first uh publicly announced that I'd that I'd been dealing with some depression and, and, and anxiety. Uh it, it kind of started after that twenty fifteen season just kind of when it started to really hit me, I just really started to feel constantly stressed and worried and um, would just beat myself up over little mistakes, was constantly agonizing over everything. I had trouble sleeping. I would just, and then that kind of led to um, a, a, a depressive state where my body just kind of wanted to shut down. I kind of lost, kind of lost my, my mojo. I kind of lost my desire to, to be social. I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to really do anything or feel anything. I was just really kind of in a, in a, in a, in a bad place, but I was able to, um, I, I decided with, with some encouragement from my parents and my family to go see a counselor and go see a therapist and just talk about it, kind of get some help and figure out what was causing this and, and kind of get to the root of my anxiety and, and my depression and, and I was able to get some help. I started to take some antidepressants and um, throughout the next year, like from 2016 to 2017, I, I just started to feel a lot better and kind of got back to being myself. And, um, and so I decided 
in April of 2017, it was it was Mental Health Awareness Month at, at BYU, and a lot of students and faculty were sharing their stories, trying to help reduce the stigma surrounding mental health and to encourage people to, to get help and to let people know that they're not alone. And it was really inspiring me, and, and I just felt inspired to share my story, to let others know that, uh, that I've been dealing with some things and that no one's immune, that even though you might think like, oh, his, his life's perfect. You know, he's, he's doing great. He's got everything figured out. He's got everything taken care of, but everyone's got something, you know, everyone's dealing with something. And oftentimes it's, it's below the surface and, and we're scared to talk about it. We're scared to be real because we want to give off this image that we're fine. We, we want to portray ourselves as uh, just strong, perfect individuals. And, and, and so I just felt like it was, it would have been, um, kind of selfish of me to to get that help but then not help anyone else mm-hmm. if that makes sense like I, I wanted to share it i because i'd gotten some help i'd gotten better and i wanted to i wanted others to feel that way too i wanted others to know that they're not alone that they can get through it too and so i just decided to share via social media my my story my experiences with mental health and and the reaction was was incredible i mean just you know my my messages on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook were just going off and just people just, you know, thousands of people reaching out saying, thank you, letting me know about their stories or their family members or loved ones stories, thanking me for helping reduce the stigma, letting people know that they're not alone. It, it, it meant a lot to to them to hear that a, you know, a, a here it is, you know, high functioning college quarterback was also, suffering a little bit and it kind of made them feel normal kind of made it feel like okay i'm not the only one like at least you know we're, we're in this together mm-hmm. and you know the news articles came out and news stories and things like that and it just all of a sudden gave me this this platform to go speak at different events to go speak at different groups speak to different groups um and it was just it was really cool to have that support to, to feel that i that i was loved that i was not alone and that I could reach out and help others and make an impact in other people's lives. And just by sharing my story, I was able to connect with so many different people and, and, um, you know, make, 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 an, make a difference in, in people's lives. And it was really fulfilling and rewarding to be vulnerable, to be real, to be genuine and to open up and admit that I was, I was struggling. And just by doing that, uh, it was a very, um, like I said, fulfilling, rewarding experience. Curious, um, and, and thank you for sharing that. It's beautiful, and, and your article and your piece will be linked in the in the show notes in the blog page. Um, but I'm I'm curious, when did you tell? Who who were who are you most fearful about telling about that? And when did you tell them? <clears throat> I was most fearful of how the coaches, how my coaches might react. Um. I had talked to my family a little bit about it and my friends, my, my, some of my best friends who were on the team, but I, I just, I knew it was, I knew their love was unconditional. I knew that they would love me no matter what they'd be there for me no matter what, but I was a little bit hesitant to, to, you know, bring it up to the coaches and, and, and that world just because I think that's a big reason why there's a stigma surrounding mental health among athletes is because our whole lives we're taught to be tough, be strong, fight through it, push through it, you know, mind over matter, toughness, and the, the sense of hyper masculinity. And, you know, if, if, if you're weak, then you can't play, you know, like you only, only the strongest play and things like that. And so it's kind of ingrained into your psyche that you can't show weakness, that you have to be tough. And so I was a little bit nervous just to, to see how they would respond you know, to see if they might view me differently or, or be hesitant or, you know, use that against me in some way. But, but it wasn't like that at all. Uh, you know, my, my coaches were very understanding. My head coach, Coach Take, you know, spoke um, in my behalf, has, you know, supported me in, in, in very public articles. Um, you know, my, my position coach at the time and coordinator Ty Detmer was very understanding. And, um, and yeah, it was, it was great that they, you know, they were happy that I'd gotten help. They were happy that I had 
taken my mental health seriously and, and taken the steps necessary to, to, to get help. And it was very comforting to see that everyone was so supportive and understanding. I think that the fear people have when it comes to mental health and other things, they think that people are going to view them differently, that they might treat them differently or they won't love them anymore. You know, it's just, we kind of fear how people are going to react, but people are way more understanding than we think. And they're way more patient and tolerant and understanding and compassionate than we think. You know, they can, they can handle more than we think they can. And, and it's, it was just, it was awesome to feel that unconditional love from everyone. And, and, um, you know, the, 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 the reception was just very, um, understanding and, 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 and that meant a lot. And it was very comforting to have that reception from everyone. I imagine you heard from a lot of other student athletes or whether it was football players in college. Um, I'm curious if you believe that coaches, when they, when they heard that and when other coaches hear that, do they say, of course, I would support you. We're a family, but I don't know if this guy could leave my team under their breath. Or do you think they say, yeah, of course, we all have our own thing. Some people have a sprained shoulder. Some people, uh, you know, are dealing with mental health. Let's get it. it let's pay attention to it. Let's work on it. And okay, n- no big deal. And, and let's just see if you can go compete in the game. And, and if you're ready to, whether it's physically or mentally, and, you know, for a guy who's lived it, I'm wondering if, uh, what your stance is on that thought? I think there will be inevitably those who are a little bit fearful or hesitant or unsure of how it, how it will affect you. Um, it's, it's, I think um, I can I can say for a fact that you know NFL scouts who have come to to BYU they've you know they've talked to our coaches and training staff and strength staff and you know a couple of my trainers have have told me that. They they ask they they ask about the mental health thing you know they ask like you know is, is he okay is he good um, you know has has, will, has it affected him will it affect him and and so I, I know it inevitably people are going to ask about it or and maybe a little bit um, unsure but at the end of the day I I don't really worry about it just because I it's, it's my story and 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 I own it. And, uh, and if, and if someone wants to treat me differently or view me differently, then, and, and that's, that's their choice. And then, and that's their prerogative, but I'm not going to let that, um, that fear of, of what others might think change me or, um, prevent me from being myself and being real about my story. And I don't want to hide or um, be ashamed of it. I just, I, I want to own it. And, and because I know how much good it can do you know, for, for others who are dealing with similar things. And, and I'm proud of the steps that I've taken to, to get help. And I, I've seen the difference I've seen, you know, I've kind of been on, I've, I've come out the other side in a way. And, and so I, you know, if they want to be fearful of it, then that's, that's okay. But if you really know me and you, and you see me and you, and you know, really know the story, then, then I think it's a good thing. It's, it, it's, it's something that I've learned from and something that I've been able to turn into a really positive um, building experience. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I love that, man. I applaud that. And uh, I think for a guy who's been around major college football for 18 years, which is, you know, more than half my life now and who have played it and coached it at a high level and now around high school athletes. And, and my analogy to high school kids is when I was in high school or even you were in high school, we were on the first or second floor of a building. And when our career ended, we took a fall, but we probably sprained our ankle. Now with the advent of social media and rankings and recruiting and pressures, et cetera, um, student athletes are at the fifth floor and they're 50 feet up. And when they fall, it could be more dangerous if we don't talk to them on their way up or talk to them when they're up yeah. there. And I think any coach good point. who, or anyone in the NFL who looks at mental health and says, Hey, is he all right? And it's not coming from an empathetic, caring lens, but one of judgment. I call BS on that because I bet majority of your locker room and your coaching staff have dealt with or are dealing with elements of mental health. I think we all do. So I applaud you, man, yeah. for standing up and owning it. And uh, if anybody has issues with that, then uh, we don't want to hang with them anyway. You know? <clears throat> well, thank you. It's, it's been interesting. I've learned 
that statistically one in five student athletes across the country um, seek seek help seek help seek help sorry with with mental health uh, and that's that's a higher number than I ever thought and and there are definitely more who don't who don't seek help um, and so it's more common than we think and there's um, you know countless individuals who who are able to get the help that they need. And, and I think it's so important for us to realize that it's, that it's okay, that it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed about or something to judge. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I just, I think it's so important for people to take their mental health seriously. It's been really cool to see athletes like Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan, um, you know, and, and, and others as well talk about mental health because it, it shows that even at the professional level, the highest levels, it, it's there's still things that people deal with and that it's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's, and it's not a, it's not a weakness to um, go get help. I think it, it's, it's, if anything, it's a sign of strength and it's, it's something to be um, proud of. Yeah. You know, I was just, uh, and last one on this topic, man, uh, I, I was with uh, Kim Holinsky this weekend, who's Tyler's mm. mom. Um, and, yeah. and everybody knows that story. If you haven't uh, look it up, Tyler Holinsky, quarterback yeah. of Washington state. Yeah took his own life and I was with her at Oregon State and Oregon State has an organization started by students called Damn Worth It and both Holinsky's Hope, Damn Worth It and other incredible organizations around the world really are about ending the stigma around, hey man, let's just talk about it. You know, let's just, you yeah. know, a lot of people yeah. love you. And I, I want to ask you, when you heard you know, or saw the alert on your phone or whatever it was last January, about Tyler. Um, I'm curious what your reaction was. And I, I remember, I specifically remember when I saw the alert on my phone, it was, it was heartbreaking. Uh, it, it kind of hit close to home be, just because he was a, a fellow quarterback. I, I never knew him, but just the fact that he was a quarterback, it kind of hit, hit close to home to me because I, I feel like a lot of quarterbacks all across the country face similar pressures and 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 it, just, it, it was heartbreaking I, I remember being really sad and i remember sending it to some of my friends and, and then i also talked about it there's a group here at, at byu it's the student athlete advisory committee and we talked about different um different different aspects of athletics and i remember bringing it up to them and talking about the importance of 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 just that, of reducing the stigma of, of talking about it, because it made me think like, man, that could, that could have been any one of us. Mm-hmm. That could have been someone here, you know, a close friend of mine. It could have been, you know, someone, someone that I knew personally. And it just, it just really opened my eyes and it was just, it was kind of just tragic. And it made me think, man, like this, this, we got to talk about this more because that's, that's, that's someone, that's someone our age, that's someone, who's playing quarterback at, at a, at a school close by. And it just really was, was, was heartbreaking. And, and, um, you know, my heart just went out to his family and just, just imagining, you know, that happening to me or my, you know, someone close to me and just how hard that would be. And so, so yeah, we, we, at BYU, we, we even made a, a video. We titled it, uh, our video, our kind of campaign was called why not now. Uh, it was just why because our logo is the why, and so we just talked about why not now? Like why not go get help now? Why not talk about it now? And, um, and so learning about Tyler's story was was um, heartbreaking, and and uh, just made us it made us really consider the importance of of taking mental health seriously because it, it really does affect more people than than we know, and it, and it's it's tragic to to lose loved ones and and. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, I, I specifically remember that, and that was very, very heartbreaking. Yeah, uh, thanks for sharing that. Okay, so here you are, senior year, unbelievable. Are you twenty? Twenty five? Twenty six? Just tur- yeah, just turned twenty five. Just turned twenty five. September birthday, right? I think you're a fellow Virgo. Yep. Um, all right, yes, so twenty five years old. We met when I believe you were sixteen. Um, so that's a long time for you still being in college, and Jameis is in his. Whatever, fifth year in the NFL. I yeah, feel like. it's crazy. I know. Um, and but I'm curious. Okay, here you are. You got, uh, you know, you're, you guys are three and three. You got six, maybe seven games left in your college career. 
what's it like being a senior, you know, and, and going through this year that's been full of some great highs, like a nice Pac-12 win over Arizona, um, and I'm sure it's had its low moments because it's football and that's what happens with the game. And what's, what's it been been like for you going into this final year knowing you've only got X amount of home games left, X amount of regular season games with these guys that you've, you've clearly grown to love? Man, senior year, it's been – it's been kind of surreal in a way. It almost hasn't hasn't hit me yet. I, I it's, it's gone by really fast. You know, we I talk about that that 2015 season where you know we we beat Nebraska and, and you know started off that season uh, with you know with that high, and then I think about everything that's kind of transpired between then, and a lot has happened, but it's gone by really fast. Um, and I remember being, you know, a freshman looking up to the seniors and thinking, you know, they're so old, they're so big and, and wise and mature and things like that. And now here I am and it's like, oh, man, it, where did the time go? And I, now I'm one of those guys that these that these young pups are looking up to. And, yeah, it's just kind of surreal. I, I don't, it's, it's weird how, how it happens. And, but I, but I, I, as I do some reflection and, and think back, I, I do see just that, that I, I'm a more – experienced mature individual who's just kind of allowed my experiences to to shape me and refine me and and and, and re- refine my character and um and I just I just feel like uh, I'm like I'm in a good place you know even though it's not always going perfect you know there's always there's always um you know ups and downs and there's things that that that, that you know that get you gets you down and gets you, you know, a little frustrated, you know, sports isn't easy. You know, you, you have the highs, like you mentioned, but then you have some lows too. And, and, uh, and that's sports for you. But, but I feel like through all of that, you know, regardless of the highs or the lows, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm more steady. Like my, my, my personality, my character, my resilience, just more constant, more steady. And, um, and I, and I, I, I recognize that in myself and I just want to be a good example to younger guys. I want to help them, um, you know, have a good start to their career. I want to be a good leader, a good friend to them. And just cause I knew, I remember how, how much it meant to have an older guy in upper class to reach out to the younger guys. I remember how much it meant to have a senior kind of take me in and treat me as a friend, as an equal. And so I'm, I'm just trying to do that myself. Just trying to, you know, make sure that everyone feels that love and feels that connection and, um, and just, kind of just, just really trying to soak it all in and make the most of it. And cause I don't know what's going to happen afterwards, you know, who knows about the NFL, who knows what will happen. It's, it's a, uh, it's, it's the dream, but you never know, you know, how, how long it's going to last. And, um, and so I'm really, really trying to enjoy this time spent with my teammates. You know, these are my best friends, you know, the guys, the guys that I've met here since I've been at BYU are the friends that I'll carry with me forever. And so I just want to enjoy it and, and make the most of that. That's great. All right, last couple quick ones. These are quick hitting answers. Um, so for you, finish the sentence. It all comes down to. It all comes down to my family. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that's that's how I feel. It, it, it at the end of the day, they're the ones who love you unconditionally. And when, when I say family, I, I I will include my closest friends. Uh, I I consider them family and and uh, include him and then also adding that to my parents, my brothers and sisters and uh, extended family. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are with you, no matter what. Whether you play well and win the game, or you play bad and you lose the game, they love you no matter what. And regardless of the frustrations or the the um, you know the the politics sometimes that, that that come with you know playing college sports, regardless of the the uh, the highs and the lows, they're there and, and they're going to be with you forever. And I, I mentioned it earlier, football will only last for so long, um, but family ties, those those your best friends and and that those relationships will last forever and they will last a lifetime. And and so for me, I just really come to appreciate the importance of that and to find those that you can always trust. To it. find those that you can always count on and to, to be there for you unconditionally. That's what it comes down to for me. Beautiful. So what are you seeking? I'm seeking a life of contentment and inner peace. Mm. I, I think, I think 
it's it's something that I've really thought about this this past um, year or so. At, at the end of last season, I I ruptured my Achilles tendon, and there was a lot of doubt swirling around in my head about you know what's my future look like, and you know, will I play football again? How will I be when I come back? Um, and it kind of made me think about long term. You know, I had to think, okay, like after after football is done, you know, whether it's in college or the NFL or whatever it's done. Um, who do I want to be? You know, what do I want to do? And who am I? What's what's my identity? Am I am I, am I just a you know am I just a quarterback? Am I just an athlete? But I you know remind myself that no that, that I'm I'm much more than that. And um, there's much more to me than just football. There's much more to my life than just football. And but but I want to use the lessons and the relationships that I've gained from football to help add to that life of peace and contentment. And, um, and I, and I think I'm, I love, I love having that, that just quest for things that bring me peace and, and, and contentment. I just, it's just, I love reading books. I love being in the outdoors here in Utah. It's beautiful. The hikes and the mountains and the rivers and the streams, like it's just, it's a beautiful place. You just feel really, uh, connected you know, when you're out in nature. And then, and then being with those that you love, like your friends and your family, like that's, that's when I'm happiest is just when I'm with them talking, just laughing, having a good time. Like that's, that's what it's all about right there. And, uh, and um, those are some of the things that bring me peace um, and music as well. And you know, the good music that you can connect to it's, it's stuff like that is are the things that I love. And th- those are the things that I seek. Beautiful. And finally, we ask everybody on this over the last two plus years, how do you feel about the word limits? Oh man, limits. I think it's it's such a uh, limiting word. <laughs> uh, it, 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 this you say the word and it just kind of evokes this image of of restraint and 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 a ceiling and, and a box. And um, I, I don't like that. I I don't like that feel. I don't like the image that it that it evokes in your mind. I, I just I think it's so much better to view life as limitless as you, as you can do whatever you want you can be whoever you want you can um you know say whatever you want and just feel whatever you want believe whatever you want and I, and I love that that potential that 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 it gives us that we're all free to choose you know and, and we should all just be understanding of that and and not ex- and not place um you know, it limits on ourselves so just just allow ourselves to to be free and and enjoy life however we enjoy it and and i i, I just think when it's the word limits um and the idea of limits is just something that i think we can we can do without i think it's just so much better to view life as as limitless and and open to uh endless possibilities i love it Tanner, we could talk for hours, man, uh, but I want to let you go. Totally, I know you got you got football season, uh, but it's it's been a joy <laughs> watching you play. Is you know the uh, whatever the sprinkles on top, man. But getting to watch you evolve as a man and get to know your family and and learn from you has been a joy. So I appreciate the time and and wishing you so much love and, and the best as you go forward. Hey, thanks, thanks so much, Joey. I appreciate it. It's it's been it's been fun, you know, seeing our our. Uh, you know, just seeing how we've grown up and now, you know, we are always learning and, and growing and I love it. So thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, brother. Talk to you soon. All right. There Ooh. it is. Tanner Mangum. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that one. Uh, like we talked about, I've known Tanner since he was a teenager and now he is a true, uh, you know, mid-20s guy, which is pretty funny. Uh, when you think about the journey he's been on. And, and I'll never forget the smile he had on when he was winning the target competition at the Elite 11. If you missed it, you can just go on YouTube and check it out. It's awesome. And then to see that uh, throughout his life and as he got honest with everyone around him, himself, uh, around mental health. I mean, why aren't we talking about it? I think like Tanner referenced or Helensky's Hope or the Damn Worth It campaign or you know any campaign or any organization wherever you live, it's important to talk about it. I think it's important to talk about everything. Um, maybe that's why I got a podcast. But uh, thanks again for leaning in. Make sure you follow Tanner Mangum's career. It's halfway through his senior year, which is crazy. And make sure you follow this podcast. Go to yogiroth.com slash podcast. Uh, all four seasons are there. Whatever you're into, leadership, 
You want to be inspired, creativity from artists, writers, athletes, coaches, uh, some of my mentors. Um, and make sure you subscribe to the How Great Is Ball newsletter. Every week, I'm giving you three different insights I get from the road and from people, uh, whether it's the CEO of Kobe Bryant's production company, who I had a chance to spend time with last week, or Pete Carroll of the Seahawks, or coaches around the country, or simple joys that I get to learn at, uh, at little coffee shops when I get to lean in and, and connect with different people in different communities I want to share. So check that out. And of course, subscribe, rate, and review, and let me know what you want more of or less of. Uh, I love hearing from you guys. This podcast uh, over the last month and a half has just grown in incredible levels. And uh, I thank and owe all of you for that. So appreciate the love. I'm out of here. You know, we end this thing that the only limits that we have in life are the ones we set ourselves. Peace.